turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at a couple of verses today. Before I forget that. Yeah. So if you find your place, let's go ahead and stand and we'll read verses 18 and 19. Depending on your version, if you have the old King James, you'll see another really long run-on sentence here. So, verses 18. Let's just go back to verse 15 to get context. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power. Lord, we love You. We thank You for the opportunity to be here. I want to thank you for your spirit working and moving. Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning that are lost. I pray that you convict their hearts, show them the need of a relationship that they can have with you through their son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that are saved, that you'll challenge them to make one step uh, closer to grow and to take one step, Lord, to follow you and what it is you have them to do. Lord, I thank you for your word and how you challenge us through it and through your spirit and how you convict us. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So last week, if you were here, we talked about growing your reputation. I asked the question, what is your reputation? What's your reputation amongst your family, your friends, your co-workers? What's the reputation of this community, this church? And we talked about what it takes to grow that reputation. We talked about that it's going to take wisdom. We have to know how to live it. It's going to take revelation. We have to know what we're learning in order to live, live out what we know. And it, ultimately, it takes knowledge of God, an experiential knowledge of God. It does us little good to come here on Sunday morning to hear the Word of God, but then never put it into practice out in the world. So we challenged you in that aspect to grow in the knowledge of God. Well, this week we're going to delve into what that means a little bit more. But before we do that, I want to remind you guys, every week we record our messages and we put them up on YouTube. Daniel has a camera back there that he does this with, but have you ever thought about how a camera works? Has anybody studied the intricacies of a camera? Anybody a nerd out there like that? A couple of you? Thank you for willing to admit that. But if you ever thought about it, it's very similar to how our eyes work. What do I mean by that? Well, light enters in, enters in through the lens. The camera's aperture adjusts to let the light in just the right amount. And then the lens will focus the light onto the image sensor. And it converts that into digital data. And then the camera processes it into a clear picture or video. Did you guys catch all that? Clear as mud? Let me boil it down. Basically, light enters in through the camera. The camera adjusts, it gets the right amount of light, and then it'll somehow work to make the image clear. Well, our eyes do the same thing. Light enters in through the cornea, the pupil will adjust to control the light, and then the lens focuses it onto the retina. Special cells convert the light into signals, and then the brain processes that into images we see. You study out the eye, and you'll come to the conclusion that it all came from a Big Bang, right? What are the chances of that? That we come from some primordial soup, and then we evolved out of that soup. There is no way. You just look at the body itself, and you know there is a creator. And it's amazing. But our eyes, that's how it works. But just as a camera needs light to capture images, our eyes need light to see. Look at verse 18. Paul prays that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Do you guys know that your mind, your heart has eyes. Kind of creepy to think about. But your eye, your mind, it has eyes. 
And what Paul is praying is he's praying that your heart and your mind would be enlightened so that you could understand what it is to know God. What is it he's referring to when he speaks of the understanding? The heart and the mind. Well, he's referring to the innermost chamber of your being. That deep place inside you that you keep guarded. You know that place that contains all your secrets. That is what God wants to enlighten. That place that you have hidden, that even those closest to you, your spouse, your family, your friends, they think they know you, but you know the darkness and the secrets that you have that no one else knows. It's places that we like to keep hidden. Paul says he's praying that that part of your being would be enlightened. It's a scary thing to think about. We think it's hidden, but God sees it perfectly. And he says, I am praying that that part of your being would be, would be enlightened. This is how we should approach the Word of God. Understand the power that it has, because just as light reveals the world to our eyes, Paul prays that light, spiritual truth, will allow us to live spiritual, confident lives. He says it is the Word of God that shines in that innermost being. You guys have been there. I've been there myself. You're sitting in church. Someone's preaching. And the Word of God and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to your heart and hits you in such a deep place that you thought, oh man, I thought no one knew about that. What about last week? I get done preaching. I have people come up to me and text me and say, man, that is exactly what God has been dealing with in my life. Just to be honest with you guys, I don't, I don't get off on the idea of of preaching hard messages that are challenging to make people feel terrible. As a matter of fact, I feel terrible before I get up to preach. But it is comforting to know that God is speaking to you the same way He is speaking to me. That is confirmation that we are on the right track. So, what is it this morning? You say you go home, I'm going to say it again. You go home, you say, hey, what was the message about? God wants you to live confidently. It's kind of ironic Because here we are, he's talking about the innermost part of your being, the part that you want to remain a secret, remain hidden, that that allows us to be really insecure in who we are. We're afraid of letting people in to see who we truly are, but yet God says, I see it clearly, and I see you for exactly who you are, and I want you to be confident. Confident. Why is that? Why is it he wants us to be confident? Well, look at verse, uh, verse 18. The first thing is, if you're taking notes, you can be confident because of your hope. Verse 18, it says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Paul starts out by saying, I am praying the eyes of your understanding are enlightened for a purpose. Do you guys know that we study scripture, not just so our head will swell, but so hopefully that our heart will swell and it'll move us to action. And Paul's saying there's a purpose behind my message. I'm not just writing this letter to you, Ephesians. I'm not just preaching to you this morning just to make you feel good. No, Paul said there is a purpose behind what I'm saying And in verse 18, he says, the eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know. If you guys don't understand this in Greek, the word that there, it literally means for an intended purpose or a direction. He's saying, I am praying this right here, this specific reason in your life to put you in a direction that will please God. And he says, that direction I'm sending is, I want you to understand the hope of his calling. I don't know if you write in your Bibles or not, but I do. I wrote underneath there, his calling. Because when I first read through this verse, I began to think about what Paul is speaking to is our calling individually. You know, every one of us, if you're saved here this morning, even if you're lost, if you're lost, God is calling you to repentance. If you're saved, God has called us to a work. But Scripture right here is saying His calling. Did you know God has a calling? God Himself has a calling. What's He referring to? He's saying, I want you to understand the hope of this calling. Before we get into what the calling is, let's think about what the word hope means. Typically, when we read Scripture, if we're not careful, we can take modern definitions and put them into Scripture to make it fit what we want to read. Sometimes it's easier on the conscience because we think that the world can dictate what the Bible is. Well, I'll tell you what, God is unchanging, His Word is unchanging, and there is a, a particular interpretation that we need to understand. So what is our modern definition of hope? Well, Friday night, I was watching baseball for the first time in a long time, and West Virginia was playing North Carolina. Joey knows what I'm talking about. My hope was that West Virginia would win. Well, my hope was shattered because in the last inning, there's two outs. There's a guy up to bat who's one of the best batters 
in college baseball, and instead of walking him, Joey, I don't understand why they did this. They should have walked the guy. The dude is literally going to the MLB because of who he is. They could have walked him, put him on base, and had some scrub come up next and, and pitch at him. What'd they do? They throw a fastball right down the stinking middle, and he hits a home run, game over. Not the wisest decision. Hope, my hope, my desire for them to win is gone. They played again last night. What happens again? This time, West Virginia, last at bat. They're up to bat. Maybe a left-handed person, I don't know. Strikes out. Game over. Yeah. Once again, season's over with. But what is biblical hope? Biblical hope, it's not based on our desires. Biblical hope is founded on God's promises, and it carries the idea of a confident expectation or anticipation based on God's assurances. Boil it down, biblical hope is a promise. It's a guarantee. And whenever the Bible speaks of hope, it is talking about God's promise to us. What is it that God has promised to all believers? Go look at verses 3 through verse 14. He has called every person that you, once you are in Jesus, once you have been saved, you have access to every spiritual blessing. And you know what that means? What is the hope of this calling? His calling is to make sure that we, once we have entered into these blessings, will one day stand before Him. If you're here this morning and you're saved, you can guarantee the fact that God is going to keep your uh, salvation secure. We're, we're on our way to heaven. We are on our way to heaven. That should give us confidence because of His calling that we can have hope, the assurance of heaven. It, it's, it's as good as done. That's why in chapter 2, he says, when God looks at us, he doesn't see us in our current form. He sees us already seated in heavenly places. Do you know God can see your life from the beginning to the end? He already sees when we're going to die. He sees when we're born. To him, he's outside of time, so he can see every act of our life all at once. And Paul is saying, you need to understand the hope of this calling. It should give you, should give you security. It should give you confidence. So many times we go through trials in life, and what's the first thing that happens is our hope begins to wane. Maybe something doesn't go well in our life, or we're facing a trial, and it's easy to get our eyes off of heaven. It's easy to get our eyes off of Jesus, and we begin to focus on this trial in our life, and we think, what is going on? God, where are you at? And he's, he's here to remind us that, look, heaven is not going anywhere. Keep your eyes on that. Allow that to be your confidence that is driving you. John MacArthur, a prominent pastor in California, said this. He said, until we comprehend who we truly are in Christ, it's impossible to live an obedient and fulfilling life. Only when we know who we really are can we live like who we are. Only when we come to understand how our lives are anchored in eternity can we have the right perspective and motivation for living in time. What's he saying? He's saying the more we understand and see with our spiritual eye, and understand Scripture, and put it into our life, only then can we live according to the truths that we know. The more information you understand, the better it can guide you. Kind of reminds me of the guy, uh, his first time going out ice fishing. Anybody been ice fishing? I've never been, but I know how I'm going to be at first. I'm going to step onto that ice, and I'm going to think, is this ice going to hold me up? Apparently, the story is the guy lays down on the ice and he spreads out wide and he's doing everything he can to make sure he doesn't fall through. As he's laying on the ice, a truck drives by, right by him, just drives right onto the ice. What is it? He, his confidence was so low because he did not understand. He didn't know that he was perfectly safe. And how we have our confidence in the Word of God will determine how confident we are in our spiritual lives. The more you understand, the better you know God, the more confident you can be tell you the story. Uh, there's a man. He decided he's going to go on his first cruise. He saves up money. He purchases the ticket. And he says, I'm going to go. Anybody out there been on a cruise? A few of you have. I've never been on one. Maybe Alaska or Caribbean in the future. That'd be fun. But here's this man. He thought, you know what? I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy a ticket and I'm going to go on the cruise. So he does this, but he doesn't understand all the ramifications that come along with this ticket. He said, I, I understand I can pay for the ticket, but I don't, I don't think I can afford the food. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some peanut butter and jelly crackers. I'm going to eat peanut butter and jelly and crackers the whole time I'm on the cruise. 
He gets on the cruise, he's looking around, and he sees people that are eating crab and steak and lobster, and he begins to get bitter. So he's watching them. Not only are they eating it, but they're going back in line, and they have more people just bringing it, bringing it, bringing it. He's like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. i got to get out of here. He goes back to his room, crackers, peanut butter and jelly. Ugh. He's miserable. Here he is, he's supposed to be having a great time on this cruise, enjoying the ride, but because of everything that's going on around him, he's not. Fourth day comes around, he says, I, I'm sick of it, I can't stand it. He goes up to a guy who's working, he says, listen, I'll go into debt, I will wash dishes, I will do whatever it takes if I can just have some of that food. I am sick and tired of eating crackers and peanut butter and jelly. Well, the worker there kind of looks at him funny, he says, sir, that's a part of your ticket. You could have been eating this the whole time. I thought, oh my goodness. You think about it. Jesus has given every believer a ticket and access to every blessing. And for a lot of Christians, you walk around and you settle for something like peanut butter and jelly crackers when you could be spiritually living in a different realm. Because we don't access it. It's either out of ignorance of the Word of God, or we allow a trial to cloud our vision, and all these different things, whatever it may be this morning. But Jesus says we should be confident. Paul says we should know the hope of his calling. If you're here this morning and you're saved, you can live life confidently because God's promise of hope. God has given us his son. He's blessed us with every blessing in Jesus, so we don't have to live cowardly lives. You know, uh, you can be confident in the hope of his calling, but this also does have an application to our vocation, to our calling person. Did you guys know that it didn't surprise God where you would be born? Did, he, did you guys know that it doesn't surprise God what job that you would be working? You say, I'm retired. It doesn't surprise God where you are in your life at this moment. He's God. He understands that. He understands the desires that he put inside of you. He understands what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be living. But he has a plan not only for our eternity, but for our life here. If you don't understand the fact that God is so intelligent that He has the ability to take care of our eternity, but we think He's so small He can't take care of our time, we're in a lot of trouble. God has a plan for your life now. Where's your hope at this morning, though? Every one of us know. It's logically, I mean, you just look at it logically, life's going to end. We're all going to die. But where is your hope this morning? Do you have the living hope that we sang about? Is your hope in money? Is your hope in the White House? <laughs> I hope not. Oh, geez. Your hope in the 401k that you have? Is your hope in retirement? What, what is your hope this morning? If it's not in Jesus, I'm telling you, you're in a lot of trouble. He not only offers us hope for this life, but hope for the next. Don't live life like the man on a cruise who is ignorant of everything that came with his ticket. Enjoy the blessings of God. Live confidently knowing that God has already planned your life. Did you know, under the calling that God has, that means He is responsible for your life and mine. So many times we wonder and worry about God's will in our life. Oh, I want to do what you want me to do, God. I, I want to follow you. I, I wanted to, to, want to do this. Did you understand God wants you to follow His will more than you want to follow His will? And so many times when I first got saved, I'd get so discouraged because I think, God, what do you want me to do? Am I going to fail? Am I going to mess up? Am I going to miss it? But I didn't understand until I studied this passage that God has that responsibility in your life. He is responsible for guiding you. You are responsible for following. There is a weird duality there. But he wants us to live confidently. God is responsible for leading. We must be responsible and follow. Paul says you can live confidently because of the hope of his calling. But next, Paul says you can live confidently because of your worth. Did you guys know, every one of you here this morning, you are valuable to God? You're valuable. You have value in the eyes of God. Look, look closely at verse 18. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened for this reason, that you may know what is the hope of his calling in what the riches of his, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His inheritance. You guys see that? You see that in, your, in the Bible there? Look back at verse 14. 
Paul said this in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. When you read verse 14 and you read verse 18, it's almost like you're thinking, did Paul, did you make a mistake? Because you said it's our inheritance. Well, Paul is also saying, you are God's inheritance. You are valuable in God's eyes. You are his riches. If you're here this morning, you say, I, you know, I don't feel very special. Let me tell you, you are in God's eyes. He has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. He has a plan for your life. And he's not going to treat his inheritance carelessly. So many times we wonder, God, do you care about me? Are you interested even in the small things in my life? Well, what does Peter talk about? He says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Yeah, God is interested even in the smallest things in your life. Well, why is that? Because God deals with us on the basis of our future, not our past. God deals with us on the basis of our future, not our past. How many of you remember the story of Gideon in the Old Testament? Book of Judges. If you never read it, go check it out. There's a man there by the name Gideon. And you study out his life, you'll see that he was very cowardly. He was afraid. But he was fed up. Here he is. He's in the wine press. And he is working with the chaff. And he's trying to separate the chaff from the wheat. Now typically what you do is, you usually go outside and you'll throw it up into the air. Because wind will blow and that will separate it. Well, because Israel at this time was under the leadership of the Midianites... They had to hide everything they were doing. Because if they didn't, the Midianites would come in and they would steal all their stuff. They wanted them to live in poverty. They were communists back then. I want to get too political, but this is what they're doing. They are totalitarian. They're, they're saying, we are going to rule your lives. So what is, what is Gideon doing? He's hiding so he can have something to eat. You read the story and you'll see that when the angel of the Lord shows up, do you guys remember how he addresses him? He walks up to Gideon he says, you cowardly guy. No, he walks up to him and he says, mighty man of val valor. That's kind of ironic. Why is he calling him a mighty man, man of valor when he's living such a cowardly life? He says, I, I know about the miracles and I know about all this stuff that's going on, but why are we stuck in the situation we're in? Long story short, Gideon constantly, in his fearful state, still follows God and obeys him. He obeys him. When God looked at Gideon, he didn't just see someone who was fearful, afraid, and cowardly. He looked at him at what he could be. I don't know where you are at this morning, what you think you are in your mind, and your heart, but God looks at you at what you can be, not what you think you are now. And I'm telling you, he looks at us based upon our future and not our past. You may get down on yourself, you may feel discouraged, but I want to tell you, be careful how you speak about yourself and others, because you are talking about God's property. You are his inheritance. You are valuable in his eyes. Yeah, God cares about my eternity, but what about life here on earth? So many people think that I'm just going to endure like it's an old school Catholic monk where you just live a terrible life until you die and then you get to enjoy heaven. No, life is supposed to start right now. This hope that we have, we are supposed to live in that hope and the reality of that hope right now. And Paul says that you can, have, you can be confident because of his hope, you can have, be confident because of uh, your worth. And then lastly, you can be confident because of his power in our lives. Power in our lives. Look at verse 19. Paul says, he's praying their eyes would be, understanding would be enlightened so they could know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. Look at those first words. In verse 19, Paul uses four different words power words to explain the power of God. I could read the verse to you literally and it'd be very confusing, but I want to talk about what these power words are that he uses to explain it. First thing you look at is, if you're using the King James Version, is the exceeding greatness. The word power there is the word dunamis. This is where we get our English word dynamite from. Now some people will say that God's power is dynamite power. Well, that would be reading our definition into it. Really what this word power means is capability or ability. So let me ask you a question. What is the capability or ability of God? What is God capable of? The power that he has? Everything. Even if you could comprehend everything, the Bible teaches that that still isn't all of his power. What is God 
able, able and capable to do. And then on top of that, can you even measure it? It's impossible. Paul is trying to get us to understand the power of God here. And then he says, it's exceeding. It's exceeding great. The word exceeding here is literally a picture of someone who is taking a rock and throwing it farther than what they intended. When I was down in Florida, I took my poles from West Virginia, my fishing poles, and I wanted to do some fishing down there. If you've ever fished at the shore, you understand you have to get that line way out there. If not, it's just going to keep coming in. Well, my six-foot poles, I kind of struggled getting that pole out there because the pendulum isn't very big. So I go and I buy an 11 or 12-foot pole because I want my cast to really get out there. So I get my pole all rigged up and everything, and I'm telling you, I throw everything I have into that. And I cast it, and I thought, my goodness... It's still going as far as I know. I'm just kidding. It's gone. It, it was exceeding what I had normally expected. And that's the picture here. When it comes to God's power, you can think of the most powerful thing, and His power is going to exceed that. Also did some research on this word exceeding, and you'll find that in ancient times, it was used in many inscriptions in Ephesus in the magical papyri, because people of that time believed that local deities possessed exceeding power, and they thought the way that we can tap into this power is through magic or rituals. They would do a certain spell or whatever it is so that they could access this power that these false gods, these little gods have. But Paul is saying God's power, the true God, His power is exceeding great. It's not activated through magic, ritual, religion. It's activated through relationship. If you're here this morning, you can have access to the power of God through your relationship. Now, I'm not talking all charismatic stuff. Obviously, we are bound within the lines of doctrine, but we have power. Thursday night, um, maybe Thursday evening, I don't know, we went and we looked at a house. Looked at several houses, actually. And we studied this one carefully. It was uglier than sin, but it had, it had a, you know, you could work with it. Kind of like God looking at us. He doesn't see us where we are, but where we can be. So what we were doing with this house. We were trying to look at it not for what it was, but what it can be. And we decided, you know what? We're going to go for it. So we put a bid on the house. But we also prayed, God, if it's not your will, intervene. You know why? Because God can see the whole story. It was right there on 21. We're going to have a kid. And I was telling Daniel, I said, the last thing I'd want to do is my kid to become a speed bump. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know why, but Saturday morning we got a call and said, hey, you didn't get the house. You didn't, you didn't get it. For some odd reason, it wasn't God's will. Now, was it upsetting? Oh, absolutely. As of Friday, Kaylee and I have been married for four years. We still don't have a home to call our own, and we've been going from house to house. It would be nice to settle down and live a little in a place that's ours. But guess what? God clearly intervened, and he showed us it wasn't his will. Now you're sitting here this morning, you think God is really interested in those little details in your, house, in your life, even about buying a house? Absolutely. Because there are no boundaries to God's power and His love and His care for us. We are His inheritance. He is in control and He's responsible for our lives. And I tell you what, when you understand that God already has a plan and a will for your life, it takes the pressure off your shoulders so much. It'll also, what, does it still hurt? Does it still bother me the fact that we don't have a house? Yeah, there's emotions that I have to deal with. But there's also a deeper emotion of joy that goes far beyond an emotion that allows us to see God is taking care of us. We can trust Him. God knows what He's doing. So, His power, it's exceedingly great. We have access to it. So what does that mean for us personally? Look at the verse 19 again. He said, what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us or for us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. He just keeps repeating himself. Now, the word working is where we get the Greek word, is the Greek word energy. It's where we get the word energy from. And I learned something new as I studied this, because if for those of you who have been here a while, you understand that word working is the Greek word energy, where we get our word energy from. I've said that multiple times. But what I learned this time is, every time that word is used in the New Testament, it's used eight times in the New Testament. Every time it's used, it's always speaking of supernatural power. Every time. Supernatural power. And what he's saying is, 
What is working inside of you is not just regular energy. It's not just your muster. It is God's power himself that is working inside you. Do you realize and understand how freeing that is? When I first got saved and I first got called to preach, I thought, man, I, I have to do so much. I, I, I really have to work so hard. And the guy I was interning under, he could see that I'm just weighing myself down because I think all this responsibility is on my shoulders. And he said, do you realize when Adam was walking in the garden, he wasn't depressed and sunken down with responsibility. He was enjoying his life with God. I didn't really catch it. The, my eyes had not been enlightened yet. But this passage teaches that it is God working in us. His responsibility to help us fulfill the work that He has called us to do. And then, look at the word mighty. You have mighty power. Iscus refers to strength, capability once again. But then the last word power is the word kratos. Now, if any of you have studied Greek mythology, you'll understand that Kratos was the personification of strength and power and believed to be a god. What Paul is saying is that God's power, the power that we have access to that is exceeding great for those who believe, this power working in us is supernatural. It's conquering power. This is power that gives us the ability to conquer anything and everything in our lives. So let me ask you a question this morning. What are you facing that could possibly stand against the power of God? Nothing. See, it's easy to catch it up here, but to really believe it down here is another thing. You know what it's going to take in order for you to really believe something? Experience. Kind of like a college student. You go through four years, six years, eight years for a two-year degree, depending on who you are. You get all this knowledge, but you don't have any real-world experience behind it. Paul is saying, I want you to understand this truth, but it's going to be the experiential knowledge of a God that allows you to truly believe it and live it. What you're going to find as you study God's Word and you live God's Word, you're going to find that He is faithful time and time again. You know what that's going to do? It's going to grow your confidence. Paul was such a weird guy. You study in the book of Romans chapter 5, you're going to see that when a trial came, instead of Paul getting all upset, he began to get excited. You don't believe me? Go read Romans chapter 5. And you'll see what Paul is talking about. He's saying, I am so excited about what I'm going through. This trial, this temptation, whatever it is, because I know God is doing something in this situation. I'm not at that point. I'm not going to say the trials I'm going through. I'm excited about it. But I tell you what, as you grow closer to Him and you begin to have more experiences with God, you can understand that whatever you're facing, God is interested in it. It's his responsibility, and there's going to be something amazing that comes out of it. You say, that's fine, Pastor Brian, that's good, I believe what you're saying. The problem is not with God, the problem is with me. We all have problems, right? Understand that. You would say, I understand how great God is and how powerful God is. I would say, man, you probably don't really understand how powerful God is. But the problem is and how powerful he is, it's how weak I am. Let me give you some good news. You are weak. If you don't think you're weak, you're in a bad spot. You know why? Because we are supposed to be weak, but God in us is what is strong. The stronger you will be, the moment you realize, I am weak, but God is strong. That's why it talks about, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Maybe you think, I'm not very gifted. I'm not very talented. I am mediocre at best. I would say, welcome to the club thinking about maybe changing the name of the church, maybe we can change it to Mediocre Baptist Church. Fit right in, right? You say, I, I'm, I'm just not that gifted. I would point you to a man named John the Baptist. John the Baptist. You guys remember him, his crazy story, all the amazing things that he did? He never did any miracles, but man, was he a wild guy. I was listening to a book the other day that talked about John the Baptist, and he pointed to a verse that Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 11, but it's also in chapter 7. When he was speaking of John the Baptist, he said this, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he said this afterwards. He said, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's talking about how great John the Baptist is. Now, I've read that for years. And every time I've read that, I thought, 
There's Jesus, there's John the Baptist, and then there's Solomon, and then there's the rest of us. Now, you used to think, John the Baptist, man, we, we could never compare to him. But if you read that verse closely, you'll see what Jesus is really saying. He is saying that the least, those that are most incapable, with no skills, whatever it is, you're limited. And he said, those that are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John the Baptist. I'm going to tell you something. If you're here this morning and you're saved, you are greater and capable of so much more than John the Baptist. Think about that. Now, why is that? Why is it Jesus would point out this truth? This isn't just Brian theology here. This is Bible. Jesus said the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. You know why that is? Because we've heard the gospel, we've believed the gospel, and we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. We limit ourselves so much. God wants you to live confidently and rest in his power. We, uh, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying the life of Job. And if you're anything like me, I don't even like to think about Job, because as soon as I do, trials start happening in my life. You know what I'm saying? It's usually how it goes. You read that book, and everything starts popping up, and all these things start going horribly wrong, or horribly right, depending on your perception. But how many are you familiar with Job? Most people. If you don't know, Job was a man who lived many years ago, Man, he was blessed by God monetarily, spiritually. He had a wife, he had 10 kids, and on one day, all 10 of his kids dead. All of his money gone. All of his livestock killed or stolen. Everything he had except for his wife gone. And on top of that, he gets covered with boils from head to toe. And it said he's left with a little pot shirt to scrape that, to ease his pain. That's horrible. I would never want to go through a trial like that. And so many times we read that passage and we think, man, I could never go through anything like that. Right? If we're, be, we're being honest, we think there, there is no way that I could endure such suffering. According to this passage, according to the New Testament, whether you understand it or believe it or not, we could go through that and even worse things. You know why? Because it's not us. The thing that is going to sustain you, the thing that will keep you, is going to be the power of God. Yeah, you yourself, if you try to rely upon yourself, you're not going to make it. You'll turn to drugs, you'll turn to drinking, whatever it may be. But Paul teaches us that regardless of what we face, it's God's responsibility in our lives. It's His power that will sustain us. I am not asking to go through a trial like that, no thank you. But I intellectually understand, according to Scripture and doctrine, that whatever it is we face, we can go through it, not because of our own strength, but because of His strength through me. It's a scary thought, but it'll change your perception. I'll finish with this. Rachel, if you come to the piano, please. I read a story the other day about a school that burned down in Atasca, Texas. This happened just before World War II. The school caught fire, and uh, tragically, it killed 263 students. There was not a family in that community that wasn't affected by this fire. Well, they went to war, and during that time at war, the town remained without a school. But when the war finally came to an end, they began to rebuild. And this time when they rebuilt, they, they, they really wanted to make sure that the tragedy that happened would never happen again. So they installed a sprinkler system. It was new. It was a new idea at this time. And they called it the finest sprinkler system in the world. As a matter of fact, people were encouraged to come and to look at the sprinkler system because people were kind of weary of what could happen again. Rightfully so. I totally understand. So they would bring people in and and they would give them a tour, and they would say, look, this is our sprinkler system. This is how secure and safe our, our environment and stuff is. And people began to grow confidence in that. And so much that the town began to grow. Grew leaps and bounds. And they had to add a wing onto the school. They're growing and everything. So they begin to build onto the school. And to their surprise, when they studied closely, they found out that the sprinkler system that they were so, had so much confidence in, 
had never been connected. It was never hooked up. It was there the whole time, but they had never connected to it. I'm going to tell you, if you're here this morning and you're saved, you have access to power that is immeasurable. It's exceeding great. It is the same power as we'll study next week. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in you and lives in me. I don't know what you think you are this morning, but God sees you for what you can be. Stop limiting yourself. I don't know what you're facing. Maybe you're going through a trial and you think, God, I I want this and I desire this and I want to follow you and I want to do what you want me to do. Understand God is responsible for our lives. You are valuable. You are precious in his sight this morning. He's responsible. We just need to follow. If you please stand with your head bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask you, are you living in light of this truth? I hope the eyes of your understanding have been enlightened this morning. I hope the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart. Because what Satan wants the most is for us to be blind. He wants our vision to be blurred. He wants us distracted with trials and temptation. He wants us thinking that it's all upon us, when in reality it's upon God. We just need to learn to turn to Him. Maybe you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord. You don't have access to this power because you don't know Him. You can never experientially have the the power of God until you know Him personally. As the Bible teaches right now, if you don't know the Lord, your eyes are blinded to the truth. I want to tell you the truth is this morning that God sent His Son because He loved you so much. He sent Jesus to die on a cross to pay a debt that we should have paid that we could never pay. To die a horrible death so that we can have a relationship with Him. And He rose again on the third day. And it teaches in the Bible... How you have access to this relationship is not by working hard or being a good person or or doing all this or doing all that. No, it's by placing your faith and trust, turning, repenting of your sin, and putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Boil it down. Where does your hope lie? Is your hope in Jesus? Or is it in something else? this morning and you're saved, don't miss out on the power that God wants you to live in. And lost person, if you're here this morning, don't miss out on the power of God to save you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life regardless of your age, regardless of season of life you're in. God loves you. He has a plan. Whatever's going on in your life, it never took him by surprise. By surprise. You may be surprised this morning, but he's not. Lord, we love you. I pray that you please just continue to illuminate the eyes of our understanding. Help us to understand the powerful truths in Scripture. Lord, help us to live those out. Pray that you help all of us, whatever it is we're facing, trial, temptation that we're going through, help us to not turn and rely upon ourselves or any other thing, but to rely upon you. We have access to power that is unlimited and that you want us to live with and through. Lord, I love you. I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, that maybe today would be the day they put their faith and trust in you. Lord, regardless of their perceptions of what their eyes have been blinded to, the truth is we know that you love every one of us. Lord, and the truth is we know that you have a plan and a life for us here to live life more abundant. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as we leave here, you keep us safe Help us to keep our minds focused on the truth of your word this week. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.